and welcome to the Game Changers podcast, where you'll hear from trailblazing, fearless women in sport. I'm Sue Anstis, and in this episode, it's hockey legend Kate Richardson Walsh, OBE. With a record 375 caps for her country, Kate was England and GB captain for 13 years culminating in that superb Olympic hockey gold at Rio in 2016. It's such a privilege to catch up with Kate as she talks openly about the highs and lows in her incredible career and her future plans. I was lucky enough to meet Kate at the very trendy Groucho Club in London. It was quite a warm day, so the air conditioning is a little loud in the background, but hopefully that won't detract from what was a wonderful conversation with one of our country's best-known female athletes. To start the interview, I asked Kate about her first memories of picking up a hockey stick. My first real um, proper memories would be playing hockey properly at school. So it would be in a, it was a P lesson, secondary school, on the Red Grah pitch at Priestnell School in Stockport. And um, I think the Mrs. Kinder, our PE teacher, would have dragged out the rubbish bin full of uh, <laughs> wooden hockey sticks that had seen better days. And we all just grabbed one. And I think that was my first proper hockey session. My sister and I both watched my mum play as little girls, but there was no junior section or anything at my mum's club. So we couldn't play, but we did have little, um, I think, kind of sawn off hockey sticks that we would terrorise people with on the sideline but it wasn't we didn't properly play it until we were at secondary school and did you love it straight away do you think I think I think I loved it most is, is that it was with other people because up to that point I'd been doing gymnastics and swimming and although you are around people in both of those sports it is quite solitary I found it quite solitary I remember in gymnastics my overriding memory is just being left with a mat saying just go and do as many backward walkovers until you've cracked it and the same with swimming you know the the session would put, be put on the on the float at the end and you would just go and follow what it said and you would just be up and down doing that. So whereas the first time I was around other people and I, I think that's the thing I loved. And did you, you mentioned other sports, so gymnastics, swimming, was there anything, once you knew you'd found hockey, was that the sport for you then forever, do you feel? Um, so we, I kept swimming, so I was swimming at Stockport Metro and then, um, and then I started swimming at Stockport Swimming Club. Um, and so probably up to the age of about 14, we were still going to swimming training two or three nights a week because hockey still then was only really at school and then I joined Disbury Gray's mm-hmm. Hockey Club. But other than that, I did athletics and netball and rounders at school, but other than that, we didn't have the opportunity to really play anything else. You know, I look now and I go into schools and I see them doing rugby and football and fencing and goodness knows what, and we you know, we just didn't have that opportunity. But I did every sport I guess I could at school. And we hear a lot, obviously, you and I both involved with Team Up and the Women's Sport Trust about teenage girls dropping out of sport. Yeah. Uh, was that a risk for you, do you think? Or was that never a consideration? <sighs> was it a risk? No, I mean, I did go through the teenage years of being an absolute pain in my parents' backsides. And, um, Surely not. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was, you know trying to find out who I was really and not really getting anywhere so just copying and falling in line with other people so going to the park drinking doing things I shouldn't have been doing um so very reassuring for other teenagers yeah. that was the case not for parents context. but yeah um and it came to a head when I was dropped from the England of 16s so I would have been age 15 and I guess at that point it was a crossroads I mean now looking back it was a crossroads I had to either decide to really look after myself, play hockey a bit more seriously, make better decisions, make better choices, or carry on doing what I was doing um, and being a bit of a rebel. And I think if I had chosen that path and just continued to go to the park, and I would have fallen out of love with sport. And yeah, I would have been one of those statistics of teenage girls that drop out of sport. I think it's that easy. And what made you, do you think, make, choose that path at that time? Did you have your eyes set on a goal for the future? I hadn't up to that point, and it was being dropped, I think, gave me a bit of a wake-up call to say, actually, I'm so upset about this, I'm so embarrassed um, and angry, and actually, why am I feeling so emotional about it? Well, I actually care. 
So I think, and I had my parents were just brilliant at that moment, just kind of asking me some really good questions and asking me what I wanted to do about it and supporting me in, in, um, in making really good choices from that point on. So choosing which college I went to, which hockey club I joined. My dad loved him, drove me and my sister an hour and 45 there and back twice a week to go to a new club. So without that support, without you know being able to make those choices and decisions, I don't think I would, or I certainly wouldn't be sitting here talking to you now. I was going to ask you about your mum, actually. Like, I don't know her, but I feel I know her through social media <laughs> and Twitter and whatever. But clearly, they have, you know, you know, as parents, a massive support to your achievements, to getting you there. Yeah, so. both my mum and dad. Mum and dad were both really sporty. It was the norm. You know, weekends were spent at the club. Disbury Greys and Disbury Cricket Club was in the same club, so we would be there in the winter watching hockey or in the summer watching cricket. And... Yeah, they've always, you know, whether they can be with us watching or not, and um, they were support, always being supportive of myself and my sister. I'm going to come on to talk a bit about role models, but who were your role models, do you think, as, a, you know, 14, 15, 16? I mean, the the one person I really vividly remember on TV was Sally Gonnell. Yeah, yeah. She'll slap me when she sees me <laughs> because she's making her feel old. But, um, yeah, the 92 Olympics, just the moment of her crossing that finish line and the utter relief I think initially and then joy of achieving her dream and you know the BBC do a lovely montage yeah. when you're on the podium like a BBC montage, <laughs> yeah, <exactly. yeah. laughs> um, and you know that whole thing you know it's just it really gripped me and but realistically it was probably the people around me so my mom and my PE teacher Mrs Kinder yeah. who she'll tell me off calling her Mrs Kinder still but <laughs> Bev they were both just um, really sporty women, loved their jobs, you know, they had families, they would just gave their energy to other people yeah. all the time. So I'd say those two. It's fantastic to hear, isn't it? The impact that they, oh. you know, know when they have that now moving Massive. forward and so on. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I should have known this, but I'm not sure I did until I've researched you well in the last few weeks. <laughs> but you were captain at 23. I don't know why I hadn't thought that you were, you know, captain so young, but at such a, such a young age. And then onwards for 13 years. So I guess so much pressure for so long. Did you ever wish you could just have been a member of the squad and the team and not have had the, all that additional pressure to perform? I think I've ever been asked that question before. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, I think I would, I would be lying if I said no. There were absolutely moments when I, I just wanted to, um, I don't know, let, maybe let my hair down a little bit. I'm, you know, like we all do, have a little bit of a wild side. And, and I did feel, particularly in the beginning, I had to hide, I really felt like I had to hide certain parts of myself. Mm. Um, wrongly, actually, it turns out. And um, it, But it took me a long time to really understand that me just being genuine and authentic actually would help other people yeah. be able to be that as well. But it took me a long time to, to realise that. And so, you know, I can, you know, I could be a bit cheeky at times and a little bit mischievous. And that was, and that was, that was, that was okay. Yeah. Cause that's part of me. But it's just picking and choosing your times and understanding the group and the people around you. But yeah, there were times when I wanted to take that responsibility off me. But for the most part, I just, I loved it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And were you a very different uh, captain at the end to where you were at the beginning like, how do you feel you changed your, your style or manner of being a captain in my head it's like night and day the difference between what I was like in the beginning and the end but I mean it'll be interesting to see what other people that I never <laughs> asked them I guess the the core of me probably stayed the same so what I believed to be my role so setting the best example that I could encouraging other people to be the best that they could and helping them be that trying to be that link with the coach and with players and I think that in, in in its essence was what I tried to do the whole way through I think how I went about that changed I think I went on a bit of a journey as a person as you know hopefully we all do just learning about how I can how I can be the best of myself and that I can't be all things to all people all the time yeah. and that you know to to recognize my ego and um and to understand that the strengths of the group and how many leaders we had in yeah. in those squads, particularly in the lead up to London and Rio in particular, and that they need to be able to lead as well, and and that's part of my responsibility as captain to encourage that um, and support that. And I think as part of the thing that I I kick myself a bit about. I genuinely only really feel like I got into my stride as captain in literally the last couple of years. But I guess it's the 
it's the way of life that you, you're never finished. It's never, you're never the finished article. Were you coached as a captain? I mean, as a, can you obviously follow the captain that you follow? You look at what they've done. Did anybody give you guidance on being a great captain in the role and so on? No, I did follow. That's what I did do. That's my kind of go-to behaviour is to copy. So I copied my the captain that I thought had done an amazing job prior to yeah. me. No, I just, I just read a lot. Yeah. I read lots of different books. I listened to lots of different interviews and read articles and just tried to formulate my own ideas. And I guess leadership in general, owning business in particular, has become such a massive topic and there are so, so <laughs> many <media>. books. Yeah. <laughs> Podcasts. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So that's kind of helped be part of that journey, yeah. I suppose, yeah. And I'm going to obviously come on to talk about massive success, but in terms of a bit of the, the podcast is looking at overcoming mm. challenges and failures. And I, and I guess there was that time you were a very young captain and then not getting, you know, qualifying for Athens and so on. So mm. looking back now, how do you think you personally cope with that disappointment and, and as captain for the team as well? I mean, I still feel it. It's, it's still, I mean, it's so long ago, but it's still so raw. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's um, because it was such a moment in time. I don't think we ever believed that would happen as that group. And, you know, for some of those women, that was the very last time they would put on that international shirt and represent their country or have the opportunity to even try and be selected for Olympics. And, and that's where it all ended. And so I, it really was a fire in me. You know, I instead of it pressing me down, I used it to to continually fire me up. That if I ever felt low or that I couldn't, you know, I I was there representing them, and I had this opportunity and I had to take it. I, I, my mum gave me a brilliant um, picture once with a it was lightning with a quote underneath, and I can't remember the whole quote, but it was something along the lines of something you have to make the best of which. which with whichever situation you are faced. And I, that, I think, is how I've tried to think. There's so many things that go wrong all of the time, on the hockey pitch, off the hockey pitch, in life, in relationships, just trying to make the best of it. Because often so much good comes out of that, those dark times. And do you think things change? It's fabulous advice as well. That is, a, in terms of life advice, isn't it, really? Taking yeah. that on board for all ages. Um, do you think, well, what made the difference then on towards uh, Beijing and then London and, and obviously Rio eventually? Do you think there was a shift in what happened with the team? Obviously funding made a big difference. Funding made a ma massive difference. I think it was, it was, it was quite, quite literally... Um, the the oh, I don't know what to say. It was the, the the calm after the storm. So you know, 2004 happened and it was it was awful. And then 20, 2005, so a year later, we were awarded the Olympics for 2012, and we had Danny Kerry on board as a new coach. Yeah. And in in that moment, it was just some of the pieces of the puzzle started to fit together, and not immediately. And I mean, it took a took a long took a good few years to get there but they at least started to be formed and start to see where we could go and how it might look and that funding that increase in funding did really really make a difference so one of my questions was going to be looking ahead to Rio mm -hmm. uh, what what had shifted there but do you think it was a shift in training mentally mental training physical training or was it a gradual process from Beijing that culminated in Rio uh, it was a real grad it was very gradual um, I mean, there was one meeting when we started our centralised programme for the first time in 2009, when we sat and for the first time in this way, we sat and talked about our vision, our purpose, who we wanted to be. And we had, we had done it before. We'd had mission statements. We'd had kind of goals. But this felt very different. This felt like a bit more of an empowerment, a bit more of responsibility for the players which was brilliant of Danny and the staff to kind of, we were very much include, in, included in conversations on the programme, how many times a week we would train, the length of the sessions we would do. And therefore we bought into what we were going to be about and from the very beginning. And so in that meeting in February 2009, we established that we wanted our vision to be gold. And that's when slowly but surely it all started to change. And was that different for the women's to the men's squad at the time? Did you, were you a separate, separate way of managing and... Do you think, or was that England GB hockey? It was very, you know, it was really separate. We um, both squads could, you know, train how they wanted to train. I think they were given the op 
opportunity to, to be centralised, to train full time. And it, it's, it's different because it's um, they're in a very different situation to us. And I'd had a conversation with a couple of the guys and a couple of the Dutch guys as well more recently. And they couldn't understand, you know, why we had a centralised programme. And I was like, well, you are, for the most part, for the elite level, you're paid to play club hockey or domestic club hockey you're paid to play. Mm -hmm. And you have been for quite a few years to a lesser or greater extent. I have always paid to play club hockey. You are able, therefore, to train kind of like a Mm full-time athlete. You've not had to work, whereas we have. Um, And although it's not enough money that they're getting from club to sustain a full-time job, it has meant that they could be more flexible with their work. And we'd we'd not had that, so we needed to train full-time. We needed that funding and we needed time together. And so it was different. Um, But they, you know, I mean, I recall... A conversation in 2009 in a lift at the European Championships in Amsterdam and one of the I'm not going to name them one of the <laughs> Dutch player male players and one of the men's RGB uh, England players rather kind of laughed at what we were doing which I really took to heart <laughs> and probably did fire me up a little bit for the foreseeable future but they, they, there was no ability to see where we were coming from and what we needed and um, where we were going as a as a women's squad, and that that it's yeah you know, maybe it is different to what they needed, but we genuinely believe this is what we needed, and thankfully results came relatively quickly to prove our point. Excellent, no, it's good, so good, yeah, exactly. Proving the pudding, isn't it? The yeah, with the yeah, gold medal. yeah. It says a lot too. Well, the first, I mean, it was two thousand ten, so we'd only been going, doing a year centralised program. We won our first um, world level medal, so we won our first Champions Trophy bronze, and we won a World Cup bronze. And then, and then 2011, we, did we get another Champions Trophy bronze? And then 2012, Champions Trophy silver. So we were constantly on podiums that we'd never been on before. Um, and so it was, proof was in the pudding. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and I guess we do a lot in the world of social media and communication. So looking at Rio, I've been really interested to hear that you were almost in a bit of a bubble, that kind of coming away from Twitter or LinkedIn or oh, um, Facebook, wherever you were at the time. And do you think that made a significant difference, that, that coming away from it at the time for Rio? Yeah, I mean, it took us a long time to get um, have 100% agreement. And if we hadn't had 100% agreement, we wouldn't have done, done it. it. Yeah, right. um, but as players, um, yeah, we decided, after lots of really good open conversations from players... Both in both ways, you know, some players saying, you know, actually, I want to stay on social media because this is my opportunity to create a bit of profile. Platform. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. You're on the world stage, and you know, we had to listen to that point of view. You know, those of us who feel like me, I was just like, well, you know, two weeks without it, I can do without it. You know, that actually, the best way to get a profile of yourself is to go and win a gold yeah. medal, <laughs> and I think the best way to do that is to is to come off it. But we had to listen to each other. And the good and the bad and the positives and the negatives. And after, I think it was about two or three meetings, we did all decide. decide yeah. I think it had a, I think it had an effect on, on us in terms of, we were quite good with not having phones at meal times and stuff because that's the time you actually listen and talk to each other and yeah, yeah. chat about stuff going on in your life in a really informal way. And if you've got your phone in front of your face, you're not doing that. Welcome to my house. Yeah, yeah well, most <laughs> people's lives. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just, I'm really bad. I'm just as bad. <laughs> so that, that was important. I think some people in our squad had had some real negative um, interactions, mm. unfortunately, on, on Twitter in particular. I'd had a little bit on Instagram and social media. And the girls spoke really openly and quite emotively about that and how hard that was, getting some of that negative feedback. The other effect I think which maybe we hadn't considered before was it had an effect on the opposition because talking to people afterwards that we'd played against are saying, you know, wow, we, we saw you all send out that last Insta post, yeah. that last tweet, and we was like, oh, right. They're serious. They're serious, And you're yeah. coordinated as well, that you were in agreement, you were a united team, weren't you, It gave that message too? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm under no illusions that, you know, maybe some of the players of an evening had a cheeky when it's <laughs> particularly when it started going well you know yeah, maybe they did have a cheeky happening. look yeah. yeah and you know that's that's absolutely fine it's not you know we're not big brother house you know you're yeah. you're, you're human beings and and particularly as it was winning every game i can imagine how tempting that would be yeah. to go and have a cheeky look but just as long as the the intent and the conversation had been had. Yeah, yeah. I think that was the most important. Uh, how, how do you deal with the negative side of social media now? Because I have to see every now and again that rears its ugly head. 
I mean, it, it's definitely gotten less. Initially, after Rio in particular, it was pretty hideous for about a year. That long? Yeah, but not, 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 but not like a lot. Yeah, yeah, sporadically, yeah. yeah. And not a lot compared to what other people get, my goodness. But it hurts. And I think actually just acknowledging the fact that it hurts and why it hurts is good. Yeah. And then report to it and then block. Yeah. And then I just try and move on. I think actually the worst thing we had... And I don't remember how it got out to the Netherlands. It's when we were playing in the Netherlands after Rio. It must have been sent to um, to Bishop Abbey Hockey's training base. And there was a, a handwritten letter and kind of scriptures and um, things taken and printed out from the Bible and highlighted. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's, that was the hardest. Because yeah. you're like, wow, you've really taken some, some time and effort. Serious matter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and I, it's really, I find it really, I'm not um, religious and I'm, and I, so I, I don't perhaps have a greater understanding as I should have. However, I do believe that all religions are about loving your fellow human. And, um, and so that's when I really start to struggle with it. And yeah. I think it's, and it's, I think it's great that people have really strong faith and religious beliefs, but I don't believe in any of those faiths at its core is their hatred because of somebody's got a different sexuality Absolutely. to you. Absolutely, love. Yeah. It's love. Yeah. No, good. good. And I, yeah, I think it's, it's something people uh, obviously struggle with, and it's, it's good to get some thoughts on, on your having yeah. been through that too. Um, I guess moving back to, to Rio and that amazing final, and mm-hmm. couldn't have been more dramatic. And I realise you you tell the story many times, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that kind of three or uh, uh, end of final time yeah. and the penalties, you know, and I guess very dramatic for us as spectators at home, a huge excitement, mm-hmm. not necessarily the result you'd have wanted on the day there. Um, but how did you feel? Can you take yourself back? now to how you felt and and I again I've heard just the level of practice and rehearsal that had gone into that moment did you have a level of confidence as as they stood for to to take those penalties yeah I mean to the point where when the final whistle went um I celebrated like maybe a little bit too (laughs) a little bit too much because I genuinely believe in that moment we had this um and I believe and I believe that because we had beaten the Netherlands on penalties at the European Championships the year before. We'd also beaten them on penalties in the European Championships in 2013. So in the lead-up to Rio, actually, in major tournaments, we'd had a really good set of results against the Dutch. So they And they'd just won on penalties in the semi-final against Germany on sudden death and I'm literally by the skin of their teeth. So I know that they're feeling nervous, anxious under pressure right now and so any positivity from our part at that moment (laughs) was going to have another effect on them so and and coupled with the fact that I know how much statistical analysis video analysis practice on the field the goalkeepers and our penalty takers had all done and more so than any other team do you feel um I think other teams practice in the same... I think other teams practice. Whether they practice in the same way, I don't know. You know, our players would practice taking the walk to the 25-yard line, which is the hideous part, frankly, Mm. that is lonely. And your legs start to shake and you realise how fatigued you are and your mind starts to tell you that you can't do this and the the goalkeeper's going to save it. And it's, it's all of that psychology and the physical preparation together. That's where I'm not sure... Whether we had the advantage, I think we probably did. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps in the England football, actually, they're doing better in penalties that way. But it's but it's yeah. been a, you know, that whole nemesis of the history of of penalties being the point at which we haven't succeeded in the past. So. Yeah, and I think I mean what a what a load to bear. You know, if oh. you're a a, a, men's in, a male England footballer and it goes to penalties, you know, I can imagine in, in immediately you're, you're not celebrating. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, because you know what every is in the mind of almost Waiting every nation <laughs> exactly exactly and um what the headline you know you're almost probably writing the headlines the next day and just some of the awful things um they've had said about them written about them people do you know burning effigies and all sorts because they've missed a penalty mm. um but now I think I think Gareth Southgate and his team I think have done a fantastic yeah, I think job. I think lots of mental health and mental approach. To Absolutely. It, it? Um, I guess one of my most abiding memories of the whole game. So thinking about this, I think I have it on my screensaver. But is you're on the podium holding that medal in both mm-hmm. hands, 
start sort of gazing at it and so, so emotional in that moment. So as I ask you now, <laughs> can you remember how you... You clearly can. Yeah. <laughs> I, what, what you were feeling at that moment, in that moment. Just so grateful and proud. It was almost a very quick flashback, you know, to through everything that I'd been through to get to that point. And then not just me also reflecting on all the women mm. around me, the women that weren't there, mm. who hadn't been selected, the women that had gone before us. It was just that whole journey I think was just in that in moment, that moment. Isn't it? and I think that's for me it's a little bit both swelling up a bit here yeah but it, when I look at that picture it is just you and you are surrounded by noise and the celebration but it is just you in that moment and another thing I should probably know the answer to this question but it's always been that you're I think you're between Susanna and Sam and yeah I always wanted Helen to be next to you number but that's just order. the line number order I yeah, thought it, it must order. have been but for me yeah I always felt like it there's two of you she, you know, she was no. she was one away wasn't she yeah number eight number <laughs> eleven yes yeah. no Susanna bless her heart did ask uh, if we wanted to, to swap, swap. no <laughs> and we said no look this is the you know this is the order that we're in and somebody actually captured a really nice photo and when we both got our medals and we just kind of leaned back behind oh. Susanna and give each other a little oh. high five um, <laughs> so we have that photo at home which is nice um, and I guess then we can move on to the closing ceremony Rio, which not gets overlooked but almost yeah. but you're the carrying the flag as well so on top of that if it could be more so how was how did that feel for you um, it felt very special, particularly because we'd been so successful as a Team GB again. Mm. Um, you know, done something that maybe nobody thought we could and bettered the medal count in um, in London. And just to represent those athletes, incredible athletes. And then to be kind of um, in the belly of the stadium waiting with all the volunteers, with all the flags and just all the athletes from all the other countries. Mm. So I had my photo taken with Simone Biles and Casta Semenya, <laughs> who I both just think are epic. Extraordinary, yeah. They're just Bravo. most extraordinary women. And I think that made it that much more special for me to say, God, I'm here amongst yeah. them who yeah, I yes. look up yeah, to absolutely. yeah and that is incredible incredible athletes so yeah and, and coming back to the UK so I think sometimes you know we wait, wait, wait for something and it comes and then there is that anticlimactic yeah. piece after D- did you experience that or uh, was it an ongoing kind of roller coaster of joy as you came back I think the first week was was just madness it I just don't think we, we slept or sat down it was really fun and being in a team is that it is that much more fun. And because we knew each other so well, however tired we were or grouchy we were, you'd be okay because my teammates get me and they know what I need right now. But then I think Helen and I took the decision to go and play in the Netherlands. And so... Had you decided that before? Yeah, so we'd... Um, when did we sorted that out? About five months before, I yeah. think, with Bloemendaal. And I think it was the next weekend after we came back, we had to go to Germany on a pre-season trip. Now, we didn't play with Blumendahl, but we went to go and watch and be part of the meetings and, talk, and meet the girls and be part of the team. So that, And they did a really nice celebration in our in our hotel room. They'd put balloons and things seen, everywhere. They yeah, they, they made shirts. Yeah, they made shirts. Yeah. Oh, they were they're so good. Um, they, they were just amazing. So, and I think that was the best decision we could have ever made. To move yourself from that, the madness that, that was. Yeah, and I think for, I mean, lots of the girls who were still here, some who were going to continue playing, you know, there was the reality and then it just felt like they were going to awards. I remember the yeah. scene on Twitter, they were just seeing like awards every week and I was like, wow, incredible to celebrate that success. But actually, in some ways, I was quite glad to be removed. To move on to it. To yeah. You obviously came back and you were very much the first um, gay couple that had mm. played and won gold and so on. So was there an element of you, and obviously being asked a lot about that rather than the sport, but I can recognise also it's, it's so important that you are the, those role models too. Yeah. Was that a concern to you that that was, became more of a story than what you'd achieved? I don't think it, I don't think it was concerned us at the time because we were very aware of the magnitude of it and that there are still today people living in the world who will be killed, jailed because of their sexuality. And so actually just two people just talking about it in an open way was was important. However, you know, and I think some of, probably some of our teammates, understandably, and I I know Danny has said, 
I think the first thing he got asked in walking to the media zone after we'd just won that gold medal was, isn't it great Kate and Helen have won as the first same-sex couple? And he was, I think it was the Daily Mail. And <laughs> yeah. Surprise. Yeah. Um, and he was, he was, he was so angry and it's really hard because he's not angry that, that no, we are a couple. But, but the rest of the team and exa- the squad and the coaches and the back, yeah. Exactly, really. exactly. Yeah. It's so much more than that. And so that's when it's that. There have been moments when I'm just like, it's oh, uncomfortable. It's, it's really not, uncomfortable. Yeah. It's not, there's, there's more here. Do more, be better, look at the wider thing. And this yeah. is a it's lovely part of it. Of it. Yeah. yeah. But there's, there has been a lot that's just focused on that and that's hard. And I guess at sport, you know, we work a lot with, with rugby and cricket and it has been a place where women can very comfortably be themselves, be lesbian, be bisexual, but not so for, for men across yeah. team sport. And I, and I guess that might, makes me really sad. I mean, you look at the, the proportions, there must be many men that are not living a, a yeah. happy life that they would wish to. Do you think that will change any time soon? I think we are moving towards that place. Do you know, even in women's sport, there there are still there are still lots lots of women living a double life, mm. um, and that's completely up to them. Of course, you know nobody has to to be open with their private lives. It's a private life, so you can keep it to yourself. But, um, but it's sad that they can't be themselves. It's that. It's like if that, you feel yeah. like you can't be, then there's you know then it, I think it's things need to be looked at. So I, I think women's sport is better. Particularly at grassroots level, I think it's much better. But I think elite level, it's still quite, there's still quite quite closeted actually. Yeah. Because uh, it will impact your, in theory, sponsorship, profile, media, all those things. Yeah, and do you know what? Maybe they don't want the whole focus to be about the fact that they're bisexual or yeah. lesbian. And actually, they just want to talk about sport. Sport, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's probably a, quite a big fear uh, and a real fear. And then for, for men, there is that plus the stereotypical traditions of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a man that plays sport and I think that the next generation coming through will demand that those traditions yeah, and stereotypes yeah. are broken um, and I think unfortunately I think it is just time yeah yeah I think people are becoming to be well more educated but that's why you know that's why education in schools is so important yes. and it's not about promoting anything it's not about talking about anything's better or more than it's just an acceptance of difference and then in order to accept difference you have to learn about it and understand it and I think that has to start at the youngest age and that's a massive debate at the moment um, with government in terms of what relationship education and and etc and I, and I genuinely believe that's where it needs to be yeah, no, yeah. And, and I guess talking role models you, I could make a very long list, but you're, you know, role modelling in terms of women's support trust and profile of female athletes and schoolgirls and mm. LGBT, and then you work with access sport for disability and inclusivity and mental health of mine. So, it, you know, is that does that you feel the pressure to to be a role model across so many different things too? Um, well, no. I mean, our agents always say, you know, you, 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 can, you can't do everything. Like, you can't. Like, and I'm like, why? Like, I, I like, why? Because I really care about all those mm. things. Um, and I think we, you know, we, you can't be across everything. But I, I, it's, it's about people and actually just people being, having opportunity and being accepted for who they are and being able to flourish and thrive. And so I think all of those, you know, all those charities that you mentioned are about that yeah. and so that's you know why I would love to do, do things with them um, and some of it's because you know I I was misinformed and I was um, uneducated and particularly on disability sport mm. and thinking that yeah hockey's great hockey's for everybody and it absolutely was not and we were and we are still closing our doors we're still closing our doors off one of my questions later in terms of hockey being no for all we think of it it is quite a white middle class absolutely so so can that change will that change you think i think um i think we have to to give everybody the opportunity to make it change you know whether it'll change or not isn't really you can't really you can't force people to play hockey but i think you have to make it accessible absolutely and available to everybody and that is still very frustrating for me you know and that's 
I think lots of good work is going on at grassroots. I think, unfortunately, facilities, I think, does does play yeah, a part and lack yeah. of facilities. However, I think we've become a bit elitist in terms of, oh, we have to have a water-based AstroTurf. <laughs> I played on red grass. It's basically concrete. Yeah. You can play on any surface, yeah. so let's just get people playing. Yeah. And... And I just think at the at the elite level, we just have to make that more accessible. And you know, less and less is on free to air TV. I think BT Sport do a brilliant, brilliant job. But I wouldn't be watching that if I was growing up. We didn't have it. Yeah. So you know, the kind of pay per view. So ticket prices. Let's make it so people can't turn it down. That people want to come and watch it at all costs because it's so cheap and it's a great day out. Yeah, yeah. Rather than trying to you know, pay for everything through the tickets. I think that's just wrong. Excellent. That's good. Okay. Yeah. Here, here. Uh, and in terms of, I guess, moving on, to, if I can, to your transition almost from sport, we have touched on that, obviously, in terms of your role around model work and so on. But how have you found that transition over the years from coming out from full-time, professional, training with a squad, knowing your routine each day mm. to life, to life, and a very busy life, but how do you feel that's been for? Um, I found it really hard. Probably still find it hard. It's the instability, I think, and the uncertainty, and and that's for just for me personally. So I think other you know other players um, who've gone into full time roles. So I mean, Georgia Twig's a good example. She's now working at Bird and Bird, right, right. and she has that stability of she knows where she's going to be every day for you know the hours that she needs to work, and she plays club for Surbiton, and she's got you know she has Sense now routine. She... Yeah, I think so. And I think it's that it's we've started to do a bit of work around values and identity and actually re-establishing that yeah. because my circumstances have changed. And does that mean that I've changed or um, actually do I just need to go back to who I am and what I believe, what I enjoy, what I don't like and starting to build, rebuild kind of my life again. And, how, and is that harder because Helen's going through that with you at the same time or is that a, a bit of both comfort but also there's two of you in the house... Yeah. Having been these professional athletes and now not. It's helpful in that I know she understands. So if I'm just having one of those days, I can just say that and she knows exactly yeah. what I mean. I think the, the challenging part of it is, I guess it's a, it's a financial instability. And, you know, if we're both thinking on what do we want to do, there's not one of us who's that kind of steady. like... Steady. Yeah, yeah, steady. I know I'm doing this. We're both... Um, she did not say I was a bit like a mum. Freelance. Met her the other day and said, are, are you OK? Where's your money coming from? <laughs> yeah. I couldn't help myself. No, no, I know. It it's right. No, it's, it's, no, but it's, it's right. <laughs> and we are getting to a point where she's doing her master's degree, so she's... She's busy doing that, but I think we are now getting to the point where we're going to start building our own business. Yes, yeah. Consultancy and um, and using all the things that we've learned as elite Absolutely. hockey players, uh, but then an, an outside of that, and Helen with her psychology, around helping people thrive, whether that's in a work environment or a school environment, just getting the best out of But people. you need to be paid. I mean, and we're a list of, look at all the things you're doing that you do pro bono, that you do free, ultimately food on the table and yeah. head mortgage didn't you really yeah. do you feel I know I love the Emma Mitchell and the lifestyle advisors at Bishop I think it's how we might have first met actually yeah. Emma, uh, at Bishop Abbey clearly prepare athletes for that transition without you know, I think they do a great job looking back now is there, are there things you feel you could have done to better prepare you for this world or is that not possible I mean I think Emma Lover spent many hours with me you know supporting me in exploring different avenues and um trying to think about what that would be and I tried (laughs) PR I did I wasn't good enough um but I tried also you know I tried sales I tried marketing I tried brand management and I liked elements of all those things but it never really gripped me Mm. and I remember Sarah Winkless came in wants to talk to the group about um, what she'd done after she'd retired. And she talked about this portfolio career, and I thought, that sort of sounds a bit posh. I'm not really sure I can do that. And actually, it's the thing that I know that I actually really do yeah. want is actually a little bit of that. Variety, absolutely. And right, not yeah. being in the same place every day. And and I think that is, is something that I now genuinely love. And I am getting there. I mean, Emma, you know, I've retired nearly three years ago, but she's still, you know, I still see her now. Oh, yeah. Um, and we've just started our Helen and I have started the athlete to coach program with England Hockey and I still see her through that so there's she is still supporting me um, 
I don't think she could have done any more. Mm-hmm. You know, having people like Sarah Winkless come in and speak did open my eyes to the, yeah, yeah, this yeah. opportunity that I didn't even know was possible. Yeah. And inevitably, it is about people and it's about um, whether that's in business or, or hockey, it's just helping people be the best that they can be. Yeah. I think that's it, basically. I, did, I had a really interesting conversation that I hadn't contemplated before, really, that in Atlanta, you know, we came away with one gold yeah. in Atlanta and then in Rio, 37 gold medals and some of those team medals. So your value as an Olympian, a gold medal Olympian, to, you know, if you're a great mm. you're okay in absolute, you're the only ones. Yeah. But you're on the speaking circuit, on businesses. You've, it's, our fabulous success has made it more competitive for athletes also yeah and yeah and I think again so St James Cracknell I remember said that don't you dare think that we you know winning this gold medal is going to set you up for the rest of your life it's that's not what it will do and that's not what it's about and he's he's totally right actually that is just the the last little cherry on the top and actually it's all the things that you have become learn make you you said yourself are you happy that you got that cherry on top so there's athletes that have done the same period whatever and never won never medaled in their sports whatever reason so you have to feel it the the value has to be in the the process and so on as well doesn't it yeah and i know that you're coaching you and helen both coaching now and your team uh, won the well, best year ever, I think. I saw. Was it Hampstead and Westminster? <laughs> Hampstead and Winter, yeah. So, is that something? Is coaching something that you see for the future? What are your aspirations on the the coaching? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I was just literally just before we started talking, I was um, what's happening with Sophie Bray, and we were just talking about how, even though we're out of the centralised program now, the the domestic season gives you a little bit of stability, mm-hmm. and that's what coaching has given me back a little bit of that continuity that two nights a week and at the weekend I'm about hockey and I can be doing other things around it that's about hockey and I and I love I have loved this season co-coaching with um Sarah Kelleher who I played with at Slough for a little bit and then against uh when she played for Ireland and she's coaching the England 18 women's team girls team and so I'm learning lots from her and just lots from the players and I and I just yeah my whole sense of being it glows a little bit when I walk out to hockey pitch on a freezing cold rainy Monday night I feel like I am home um, so it's been good and a national coaching role in the future is that something that you would look to do in the future or are you just enjoying it um, where you are now I mean I kind of feel like where I end up will be where I end up and i Maybe I will become more aspirational. I mean, I think it would be incredible to be the national, uh, any national team coach. But I think at the moment, I just want to keep developing as a coach and improving as a as a as a leader in that role and and how I how I function as as being a coach. So I think it's, I'm just going to focus on that, and then you know what will be will be yeah. And I guess advice, you've obviously lived and breathed hockey for so long. So young women coming through where you were at that crossroads in your life, mm. is there any advice that you would uh, like to impart to them almost? as they... I think that when I go to speak in schools, the, the, my, my biggest thing I say is, is just try and work out who you want to be. And that will change and it will develop and your ambitions will, will change and... You know, sometimes it feels like day to day, but the the essence of who you are is a thing to really think about and be curious about and give yourself time to to be curious about that. And I think I, I just didn't do that. I just was so intent on fitting in at whatever cost that that was nearly at a cost to me. And I see it everywhere I go in every school. Yeah. Um, and it's just if you can be true to yourself, you will not go far wrong in life. And I've listened, I know I had the pleasure to listen to you and Helen speaking in, in terms of corporate business talks that you're doing a lot of that at the moment and mm. also some of the podcasts. You talk about finding your super strength. So yeah. I guess is that a similar, kind of magnifying that, but in an adult sense too? Yeah, I mean, it was a revelation when we did it with the team. You'd think 31, 28 best players in the country would know what their super strengths were. We just didn't. As individuals or in a physicality playing? As sort? individuals. Yeah. So, you know, I was I got really annoyed at the beginning that all my super strengths seemed to be off the hockey pitch. I was like, <laughs> I'm supposed to be here to play hockey. I must have some super strength. Um, but th- but that, is my, that was my job. 
Yeah. So, you know, that's my value. That's my worth in this team. That's who I am. And that's what my teammates need from me. And, and actually, in that way, they can demand it from me. And so in me knowing my strengths and you knowing my strengths, we can both get the best out of me. I can help get the best out of you. And then to collectively, all those little percentages add up to us all thriving and the team thriving. So when we got there, when we did that, it was just, it was just amazing. And, the, and one of the biggest differences, I think. And when did that happen? Was that early? So the there? first time we did it was, I think it was 2011. I feel like it was in San Diego with our psychologist at the time, Tom Cross. Um, and it was hard. It was really hard. Mm. It was quite, I mean, it's as hard as it is to share anything with a group of people. To stand up and say, I am exceptional at this. Yeah. You know, it makes you cringe yeah. a little bit. But it's, it's so important to own that. Yeah. And, and as women, a little bit oh. of women, the whole, uh, you know, imposter syndrome, I play it down, be a very humble, because that's more attractive. It's just, uh, you know, yeah. It's a trait, isn't it, to stand up and own it? Yeah, absolutely. And I still have imposter syndrome now. I don't, yeah, I don't think I can stop the internal voice when I'm, you know, speaking to a company and I... I are they listening to me? I'm not there. <laughs> Whilst I'm speaking, I'm not sure this is coming across really well. Um, I heard someone say recently, anyone that doesn't have it is probably a fraud or they're a complete psychopath. We all have it in our... There's yeah. accepting that, that that is as we are. Well, I'm reading a book at the moment by Eckhart Tolle called uh, A New Earth. So he wrote The Power of Now. He's talking about that voice and that it's it's the recognition of that voice that it's, it's separate to you, yeah. that that is mindfulness and awareness and that's yeah. where you know, you will grow. So I am aware of it. You're listening? Yeah. <laughs> a couple of fi- final questions. As the podcast is called The Game Changers, and it's about trailblazing, fearless, extraordinary women. Uh, and I guess, I guess, looking back in another 30 years' time, what do you think you're... you're you've obviously had a huge impact oh in goodness. sport, on this sport, but uh, do you ever think about what you, you'd like to leave as that legacy? Wow. Um, it's a huge, massive question. Isn't, yeah, it? isn't it? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I think... No, I think it's more the legacy would be that I've helped people on a, either on a very small scale or a large scale to really be the very best version of themselves. I think that is what I feel is how people helped me and how I hope I can help other people. And if that means a woman in Yorkshire feels that she can go to back to hockey session once in a blue moon and be with some like-minded people who will support her then that is it how could you not be inspired to be the very best version of yourself having listened to the rather brilliant Kate Richardson Walsh I so enjoyed our conversation and very much look forward to following her career in the years ahead I'd love to know what you think about the Game Changers podcast so please do leave us a review or a rating It does make a big difference and helps to spread the word of these amazing women in sport. And if you don't want to miss out on future episodes, you can subscribe to The Game Changers and find out more about all of my guests at promotepr.com slash gamechangers. In the next podcast, you'll hear from netball legend and former England captain Pamela Cookie. Pamela was the face of England netball for 11 years with 110 caps and she's the only player to have won seven league titles. It was wonderful to talk to Pamela about her amazing playing career and her work now as a netball commentator for Sky, especially as we head towards the Netball World Cup in Liverpool later this month. Going to be out for six months at least, sitting on the sideline just uh, watching all my friends and my teammates doing the sport that I love and not being able to be part of it. That was devastating for me. It was, you know, when you work so hard to try and do something and then it gets taken away from you just like that.